What's up, One Church? How are you feeling today? Good to see you. Had a little technical difficulty there. Thank you for your patience. How you doing, Gahanna? It's good to see everybody here in Gahanna. Everybody at Northwest Columbus, we love you at Northwest. Happy birthday. Everybody online, happy birthday to you. And, uh, you know, speaking of parties, we just mentioned a moment ago about the Night to Shine event, uh, the prom event that we do for special needs folks 14 and up. This year's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a virtual event. We uh, partner with the Tim Tebow Foundation in this whole deal, but uh, even though we won't be able to be in person, we, we kind of want to keep it going. And so um, if you are interested in serving, you can go to one.church slash neighbor and uh, you can be a buddy. And actually what the role of the buddy is you'll connect uh, via either like Zoom or FaceTime or phone call beforehand. And then they're going to do it all on, uh, you know, in a virtual way. So uh, you can continue to kind of reach out, build those relationships. And then hopefully uh, next year we'll be able to be back to in person. Uh, I want to jump into today's message. Uh, the series we're doing right now is called Discover, and we're just using this one word to really embody the attitude that we are taking as followers of Jesus in this season of time. Uh, things are chaotic and crazy. You don't need me to uh, give you a recap of what the last year has been like, uh, but there's just something that's welling up in our hearts that really is anticipating the way that God takes really tough situations. God takes chaos. He brings order and he, you know, applies his will and his word to these situations. And really the only evidence that we need is to look into the word of God. When you look in the Bible, you see both Old and New Testament. You see people uh, who were used by God. Sometimes it was in uh, military captivity. Sometimes they were in economic depression. Um, there was uh, times where there was uh, injustice and oppression. There were all kinds of like life situations where God would use leaders, men and women of God, to, to step up to the plate during tough times. And, and he would use them in special ways. And, you know, we can miss the opportunity if we take the wrong attitude. Uh, the good news is you're in full control of your attitude. Uh, there's a lot of things you're not in control of. You're not in control of a lot of life events. You're not in control of how things pan out. Uh, there are certain decisions that affect you that you don't have any control of. But you always have full control of your attitude and how you approach what you're doing. And so we're just saying, look, instead of a sort of hunkering down and playing defense and, oh, we're going to maybe try to restore everything that was taken. No, we're, we're, we're like spirit of uh, Sir Francis Drake in the house, right? It's like Lewis and Clark. We're, we're going west. I mean, we're, what, what do you have, God? What, what do you want to do through me? What do you want me to see? We're hunting for revelation. We're, we're receptive to what God wants us to do. We're remaining flexible in this next season of God. What, what do you want me? What do you want you? What do you want us to do? And so we're taking the attitude of discover. Uh, today what I want to do is I'm going to read you two scriptures. I'm going to write down two statements and then we're going to talk about it and then I'll get out of your way. All right. We're going to start in Exodus chapter three and Exodus chapter three. We started looking at this last week. There's a character on the forefront of this text by the name of Moses uh, Moses, we look at in hindsight, is sort of this hero deliverer. He delivered the nation of Israel. He led them out of captivity. They had been in bondage, by the way, for 430 years. So they knew captivity. They knew how to do bondage. And yet they didn't quite yet know how to get free or how to live free. And God goes to Moses, who in, in many ways was the most unlikely character. He was a fugitive. Uh, he, was, he was on the run because he had committed murder. And so uh, he had morally disqualified himself. He had legally disqualified himself. And yet God shows up and says, Moses, you're the one. I want to use you to lead this nation in Exodus 3, verse 4. And so here, here's what it says. When the Lord saw Moses... Coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. So he calls him by name. And here's how Moses responds. He says, here I am. Here I am. I want to jump real quick over to the New Testament, and, and we'll look a little bit further into this verse in just a minute. But Matthew 16, 18, Jesus is talking, and he says, upon this rock... I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. He says, I will build. I will build. These are the two statements we want to learn a little bit more about today. Here I am and I will build. 
This week, I'll just be right up front, I'll tell you, I've been in my feelings all week. Because we're leading up to, you know, this is the 10th birthday and uh, just been reminiscing. You know, it's, it, it's one of those things, you know, the 10 years in some ways has felt like longer than 10 years. It's felt like, you know, 50 years. Like I can't hardly remember before, you know. And, uh, and in other ways, it's like, feels like a flash, like it just happened really quickly. And so I've gone back, you know, fortunately, we've documented this journey with pictures and videos. And so I've gone back and watched videos and, 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 and sort of relived these days. And um, uh, in fact, th- this week I was in an old book and I found I, was, I had been using years ago as a bookmark our launch card. In fact, go ahead and bring up that, uh, that launch card. This was our, our launch card. So we printed up thousands of these things and we did hand-to-hand combat, man. We were giving out these cards. Everybody, you know, give them to your friends, give them to your enemies, give them to your frenemies. Everybody gets one. We were ding-dong ditching people, leaving cards. I mean, we were putting them on people's windshields and, and, and mailboxes. I mean, we were just getting these cards out everywhere. And our launch date was January 23rd. We thought that was kind of cute. It was like one, two, three. Come on. Nobody's feeling it. All right, that's fine. They, they weren't then either, but we thought it was cool. January 23rd, one, two, three, launch. And, uh, and then on the back of the card, you know, it had the, the, the address and, and, and the location. We were meeting at this Cornerstone Academy over on Walnut Street. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that and I'm remembering, you know, handing those out. We went the week before, by the way, the week before we launched, we went during service time and knocked all the doors in the neighborhood because we're like, hey, if they're at home at 10 a.m. on Sunday, they're a prime candidate to come join the, the family, you know? So we started knocking on doors and doing all of those things. And uh, in fact, I got a picture from our launch Sunday. I'll, I'll never forget this. You know, I'd been working at a fitness club uh, to meet people. And I remember looking up, seeing all these people that I'd met at the front desk at the fitness club and just very emotional, heart overwhelmed. Uh, we were given a plaque by a, a friend of mine named Eric Schroeder who trained us how to plan a church because, I mean, we're like, we felt like we we're supposed to plan a church, but how do you do that, you know? Uh, I remember, actually, I met somebody at the front desk, and I was like, yeah, we're starting a church, and they're like, how do you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. And I was like, if, 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 you, if, you, if you figure it out, let me know because I'm trying to figure it out. Well, Eric trained us, and then that day when we launched the first service, he gave us a plaque like, hey, you're at church now. So like, all right, and uh, I just remember that day, and and, you know, if, if I rewind a little bit more, actually, I want to take you back to the moment that Shaylin and I made the decision to come here. Uh, because we're not from Columbus. I, uh, we didn't really hardly know anybody in Columbus. So it wasn't familiar territory. We, we just felt like God was leading us to start a new church. So we actually went to some other states and some other cities. And we just started exploring, trying to discover the will of God. And you know what we, we did? Uh, we didn't know what else to do. So we just would drive into these cities park our car, get out, talk to people, and pray. And, and we were hoping God would nudge us in the right direction. And I remember we, we would go, we started feeling drawn to Columbus, but I didn't know Columbus. I didn't know anything about it, really, other than that the Buckeyes were here. That was about it. I didn't know much else. So I, I would, we would go in, park our car, be talking to people. We'd get back in the car, and I'd be like, hey, Shaylin, like, what do you think? She's like, I don't know. You know, I'm like, man, me either. You know, I don't know. Like, and then it's like, we, I felt foolish. I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, what are we even doing right now? You know, like, am I expecting like God to do what he did in Bethlehem when Jesus was born and put a star out there and just like, Psh, this is the place or write it in the clouds. Like, I didn't know it was an audible voice. What, what am I even, what are we doing? But we just kind of kept doing this, you know, and one, one day we rolled into Northeast Columbus. We went into the lifestyle communities and we, we went in, there was just something. I don't know, the best way I could describe it, it felt like going home to a place we had never been. We started talking to people, we felt a, a connection, and we're like, man, maybe this might be it. But we didn't want to be impulsive and just jump into it, so we took some time and we prayed about it, and we would make trips back and forth and, and keep talking. And one night, we're laying in bed, it's pitch dark, I, I hadn't said anything for probably 20 minutes, I'm just laying there in bed, and Shaylin goes, what are you thinking about? I was like, how'd you even know I'm awake? I haven't even said anything for 20 minutes. She's like, I can feel you thinking. I was like, what does that even mean? I was like, you feel me think? She's like, you're a loud thinker and you're thinking loud right now. I was like, well, I was like, you know, I think we're supposed to go to Columbus. I just think we're supposed to go. She's like, me too. And then she rolled over and went to sleep and I couldn't sleep. I was wide awake, man. I ended up getting out of bed. I, I still can feel it. I went in the... 
I went face down in the carpet in our bedroom, and I just prayed, and I was like, Lord, I've never planned a church before. I don't know what I'm doing. We don't have the money for it. Uh, the economy's not so hot. Uh, we're upside down on our house in terms of market value. Like, I don't know. I just sense that you're asking us to do this, and, and, and all I know to do is say, here I am. It's all I know to do is just to say, here I am, to raise my hand and volunteer myself and to say, Lord, if there's anything in me you can use, use it. If I got a skill set you can use, use it. You want to use my energy, use it, Lord. You use my heart, use it. My hands, whatever. Lord, use me. Here I am. And it was in that moment that we just made a decision. And I remember having to wrestle this all the way to the ground of like, you know, even if we go to Columbus and Nobody comes to this church, and, and we're not able to raise the funds to get what we need to get. And, and at some point, we got to cut bait. At some point, we just, you know what? We, it didn't work. It didn't work. I, I won't be ashamed. I won't be ashamed. I, I refuse to feel like a failure for listening to the voice of God, perceiving and sensing what he's telling me to do, lifting my hand up and saying, here I am. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But taking a leap of faith, a step of faith, and walking in obedience to God is nothing to be ashamed of. So we made that decision. Here I am. You know, as I looked at these pictures over the last 10 years, I can just see one here I am after another. You know, I look, I see things in the pictures other people don't see. Like, I can look in my own eyes, and I can see times where there were seasons where it really looked on the outside like we were succeeding, but I didn't feel like we were succeeding. I didn't feel like a success. It felt like it wasn't enough. I felt like I wasn't preaching good enough. It wasn't leading good enough. We weren't problem solving good enough. I felt like we weren't building adequate systems. I remember there was a whole season of the church we had nothing for teenagers. And so people come in with teenagers. Oh, this church is great. What do you have for teenagers? We're like, nothing. Um, But would you want to start something? They're like, nope. And then they'd leave and go somewhere else. And I'm like, ah, we're not even serving the whole family. I remember having an inbox full of complaints. I remember having, you know, just things that I just felt like, I wasn't a good enough leader. Like we could, we're not, we're not doing this. We don't have enough. So I look at those pictures and even sometimes I was smiling. I remember what I was feeling inside and feeling like I wanted to quit and feeling like God could have made a much better pick than me for this assignment. And yet I just kept lifting up my hand. I just kept saying, here I am. I just kept saying, Lord, here I am. And when you really look at it, that's what God wants from us. Right? We overcomplicate it sometimes. Sometimes we make it so big, like we got big dreams, we have big ambitions. Sometimes we're very precise about what we want it to look like and how we want it to feel, where we want to go. And so we, we start looking at the complexity of everything. But friend, I'm here today to bring you to the simple, the simplicity, which is what God really wants from you, is for you day after day, season after season, to keep throwing your hand in the air and saying, here I am. You know, we just looked at Exodus 3, which was Moses saying, here I am. And I did a little homework for you all this week. I found out there are six people in the Bible who said those words, here I am, documented. The first was Abraham. Abraham said, here I am. And he said, here I am to the worst assignment in the Bible, okay? A lot of times I get up, by the way, and I'll talk about different parts of the Bible. I'm like, this is my favorite scripture. Oh, this is the best story. This is the worst story in the Bible. I, I'll be happy if I, I, hopefully I'll talk about it today. I'll never talk about it again. I do not like this story. If I could take something out of the Bible, it'd be this story, but it's just a bad story. It's, it's, it's Genesis 22, and you have Abraham and his wife, Sarah. All they wanted was a child. They had been hoping for a child and trying for a child and praying for a child. And eventually, in, in their 90s, they get pregnant. Give, and she gives, I know, it's like, what? And they give birth to Isaac. And Isaac's their son. He grows into a young man, and now they're just enjoying being parents. And it, but Isaac starts to become their whole focus. Isaac starts to take, almost become on the throne of their heart, become a god. And so God tests Abraham, and he says, Abraham, I want to I find out if your son has become an idol. And he calls him by name, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham says, here I am. And God says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. It's like, what? Sacrifices? Like, I want you to execute your son. And so Abraham is being tested by God. He goes and he's getting ready to follow through with it. And in verse 11, an angel of the Lord says, Abraham, Abraham, a second time. Abraham says, here I am. 
He says, don't do it. Here's a ram in the thicket. Sacrifice that. You pass the test. So two different times. On the front end and the back end of the worst assignment I know of, like you thought your assignment was bad. Abraham's was worse. Um, Abraham said, here I am, even though it was the most unpleasant assignment I can imagine. The second person who said, here I am, was Abraham's grandson, Jacob. And like his grandpa, he said, here I am twice. The first time he was in the middle of a job transition, he has a dream and an angel speaks to him and he says, here I am. And the second time he moved to a new country, God was sending him to Egypt and he was taking a geographic shift and he says, here I am. Uh, The third person was Moses. The fourth person was Samuel. Samuel was a kid, young boy. And and he, one night he's sleeping and he hears a voice calling, Samuel, Samuel. And he thinks, thinks it's his boss. And so he goes to Eli the prophet. He's like, here I am. Eli's like, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Three times after the third time, Eli says to him, hey, I'm not talking to you. It must be God. If you hear the voice again, don't say here I am. Say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening because God has an assignment for you. The fifth person was Isaiah. This is a good one. Isaiah uh, is is the prophet that God was raising up for his generation to to be a a transformative figure, to be a catalyst for change. And he said, we need somebody with some guts. And it says in Isaiah 6, 8 from Isaiah's own hand, he said, I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go? Who's got the heart to do it? And, and, And Isaiah goes, here am I, send me. He volunteers. The sixth one is the only New Testament version. It's in uh, uh, Acts 9, a guy named Ananias, who really in his own right, we don't really have much documented about him. We, We don't have his exploits or his resume. His biggest thing he did was he showed up for the Apostle Paul during his formative years, during a time where he was having a major transformation and he, he mentored him and he supported him and he helped prepare him for Paul's assignment, which would be to plant churches all over the Mediterranean rim and to do these missionary journeys and write half of the New Testament. So these six characters say the same thing. Here I am. They were available. I want you to think about for a moment this one word, the word here. I want you to think about what, what does it mean for you to be here? Like, what does here mean for you? Like, of course, we have our here in terms of geography. Like, if you're in the same space with me here in this room, um, you're in Columbus, so we're geographically here. But there are others watching online that may be in totally different places, but you're where you are. You're here. Um, I want you to think about what it means here in terms of being in 2021 and the time we live. We live in the information age. Uh, We live in the middle of this pandemic. Like, you're here now. You're not living 200 years ago. You're not living in the dark ages. You're living here in this moment in time. I want you to think about the fact that you're here. Like, you're not dead. You're alive. I... uh, when I was looking through pictures, I looked at all the pictures from our first pre-launch service, which was August of 2010. And one of the photographers captured a picture of me shaking hands with a young man who came to that service who I met at our first pre-launch service. And a few years later, I did his funeral. He died tragically. And I couldn't help but think about the fact that he's not here. And that for some reason, I'm still here and you're still here. But he's not here. So maybe as you think about you're here, you think about the fact that there are some people that you thought would be here who aren't here, but you're here. Like, like, like maybe you had a couple times, like it was that close and you wouldn't have been here. Maybe you zig, if you zigged instead of zagged in the car, you wouldn't have been here. The accident would have taken you out. Or maybe you've made it through rounds of, of chemotherapy or you've come through some things that they didn't think you were going to be here. And you can think of the people who aren't. Don't ever take here for granted. Don't ever take the fact that you're here for granted, that God has you here, and you won't always be here. So think about the gravity of the word here, all that you've learned, where you've been, what you've been through, all the twists and turns on your journey, the relationships you thought would last forever that didn't, the career you thought was going to materialize, and it went over here all the side roads, all the detours, everything that's led to here in this unique place that you are. And we bring it down to what 
really is the win, like what really God wants from you. And that's for you to take your here and to say, God, with all that that means for me, in this moment, I raise my hand and I say, here I am. I was talking to my friend this past week and um, he was kind of sharing some of the things about his life. He tried some things in his career. Uh, at one point he was working for like a, a marketing company and, and uh, he was marketing these products and he was like, you know, I wanna, I wanna do, you know, all these skills I have in marketing, I wanna use them for God. And, and so he made a plunge into to, to, you know, full-time ministry and he did a few different things and tried a few different roles and, and, and each one of them kind of led to a different thing and now he's making another shift, almost kind of, you know, kind of figuring out what's it going to be next. And we're, as we were talking, you know, he's kind of processing through his thoughts. And he was like, you know, I, he goes, I, I thought things were going to be different. He goes, you know, I sort of had in my mind's eye when I made this move um, that it was going to kind of look a certain way. I had a very kind of clear path. He goes, and it didn't work out like that. And he was kind of processing those feelings. Like, how should I feel about this? Like, did I do something wrong? Uh, if I would have done something different, would it have turned out different? Like, what do I make of all this? And uh, as he was talking, a thought crystallized for me that I, I, it really, that conversation helped me see something clearly about myself. And actually, okay, so I'm 40 years old. The first 20 years of my life, everything I did was a zero-sum game, okay? What I mean by that is you win or you lose, okay? It's all up to a win or loss. Like, if you're playing sports and you score 89 points and the other team scores 90, it's just an L, Okay, you just lose. There is no, oh, it was close. Oh, we only lost by one. It doesn't matter if you lost by one. There are no moral victory. This is a loss. We lost. So for me, all of my training, all of my, um, you know, my focus and my preparation and everything I did with my body and my mind and, and, and my focus and my toughness and everything was to go in and win the game. And I only cared about winning. I didn't care how many touchdowns I had or how many points I had. I only cared if we won or lost. So the pressure of that, and that was the, the lens that I saw the world through was zero sum game. First 20 years. The second 20 years of my life, pretty much nothing is a zero sum game. Pretty much nothing. God is working through things in every situation. Like there are times that something feels like a loss. I shot my shot, didn't work out. Hey, I had my vision, didn't work out. I, I, I did these things, you know, these inputs, I didn't get the output that I wanted. And so we, we have these feelings of failure. We have these feelings that we get an L in the L column. And frankly, sometimes the world will put an L there. Sometimes your emotions will put an L there. But when you really look through the lens of what God does in the life of a person, like it's not a zero sum game. Even when something doesn't work out the way you thought, God is working it out. In the, it, something's changing within you. And I told my friend, I said, listen, man, this isn't just me trying to give you a pep talk and, you know, encourage, you know, be encouraging and whatever. I'm like, bro, it's not a zero-sum game. You, you develop, you change, you learn some things. You're going to go into the next thing different than you were in the last thing. Like, you got to see through a different set of eyes that, that really what you did in those steps was you said, here I am. And as long as you're saying, here I am, as long as you're making your life about being obedient to God and about walking the path that he's given you, whatever twists and turns, whatever man versus man and man versus nature and man versus self, it's going to hit you a hundred different ways. You just can't look at it as hard wins and losses. And friend, I say the same thing to you. There, there are some things God's doing. He's begun a good work. He'll carry it through to completion. He causes things to work together for those who, who love him or called according to his purpose. There's just things at work right now that you can't look at as hard wins or hard losses. It's, it's just a matter of walking in here I am. All right. I want you to press pause on here I am for a moment. And let's just hold that thought. And I want to jump over to this one, right? The I will build. This comes out of Matthew 16. Uh, this is a conversation Jesus with his disciples, he's trying to help them connect the dots. And so he's been doing these miracles and he's been hanging out with them and he wants to know if they're understanding who he is and what he's all about. So he says, hey, who, who do people say that I am? What's my reputation? And they're like, oh, some people think you're John the Baptist and some think you're Elijah and some blah, 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 blah. And Jesus goes, okay, that's fine, that's fine. That's what the headlines say. Who do you say that I am? You guys are the ones right here with me. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, oh, I know who you are. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. 
And so Peter just blurts out this revelation. In fact, Jesus says, that's right, Peter. Nobody told you that. Nobody taught you that. God himself showed you that. And then he says, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, the cool thing is when you look in the original language, Jesus twists up the phrase a little bit because Peter's name was Petros. Petros means little rock, pebble, small little rock. And then there's the word Petra, which means huge boulder, big, huge, massive rock. And so Jesus, if you, if you read it in English, it just says, yeah, you're Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. But what Jesus really said was, yeah, you're, yeah, you're a little rock. Hey, little rock, upon this big rock, I will build my church. Peter, we're not building it on you. We're building it on the rock of what you just said. We're building it on the Petra, the big thing you just said, which was the revelation of Jesus. And he says, upon that rock, I will build my church. Now, what's Jesus talking about when he says build my church? Because we're in church and we're celebrating one church's 10th birthday. But I don't want you to get it twisted. I'm not talking to you today that when Jesus said, I will build my church, he was talking about square footage or brick and mortar alone. Those things only facilitate the real church and the real church are people, human beings, building people, seeking and saving that which was lost, proliferating the gospel, embodying the, the body of Christ in our community and spreading the good news and, and, and even living it, personifying it as Jesus did. And when you bring your here I am to his I will build, now you're really finding your life purpose. That's what it is. And don't try to switch roles with God. He's the one that builds. You're the one that lifts your hand and volunteers yourself. I want you to really get this because when you make decisions in your life, we make future decisions if we're wise based on truth and based on as much certainty as we can, right? Like, like think about, you make your decisions based on what's true. Like think about mathematic truth, right? You're making, you, you know truth about two plus two equals four. You know that two minus three is negative one. It's predictable. It's certain. It's the same every time. We know laws of science. What goes up comes down. There's laws of physics and things that are laws. You just can't break it. You got to follow it. So you make decisions accordingly. We make decisions with our human logic and our brain, right? Greg is a man. Man is mortal. Therefore, Greg is mortal. So you use deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning to try to anticipate next moves. But there's other kinds of truth and there's other kinds of things that have varying degrees of certainty. Like, for example... There are things that may or may not be true based on the act of the human will, all right? Let's take, for example, my wife, Shaylin, and I are married, right? And we made the statement, we're going to be together till death do us part. Well, is that true? It, it, it could be true. It's true depending on the acts of our will. We made the promise. We guaranteed each other we're going to do it. When we talk about being married, we don't talk about it in terms of maybe. We don't go, you know, we're going to give it another seven years. We'll see where we're at. You know, we'll re-sign, you know, in five years. We'll see where you're, you know, we'll take it. It's going to take it a year at a time. No, when we talk about it, we talk about it with certainty. We talk about it with confidence. And we have 17 years of evidence that uh, the will that we have and the character that we have, that we've been willing to fight through stuff. We've been willing to work it out. We've been willing to take everything that's come at us. And so when we talk about the future, what's going to happen in the future, we say, this is what's going to happen. But here's what we know. The human will doesn't always follow through in all kinds of things. So we, we walk forward when things related to the human will with a certain amount of uncertainty. There's the third type of truth or certainty which comes from the will of God. This is faith certainty. This is what God said he will do. These, these are the promises of God. So when we look within the scripture, we're looking for things that God guarantees, the things he says he'll do. And it's not always that he's going to make all of our wildest dreams come true or that he's necessarily going to answer every prayer that we have according to our wish list. Well, we have a, a certain guarantees from God, and one of them comes from Jesus himself when he says, I will build my church. I will build my church. I will and anybody who brings their here I am to, to his I will build is going to be a part of a win. You're going to be part of something that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. You're walking through with certainty. And, and I want you to understand that because we live in a time where, where, where there's a certain amount of desperation and fear that people have, like that somehow God's on his heels or somehow that the, the church is in jeopardy. Friend, the church is not in jeopardy. 
God, 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 God can build his church in communism. He can build his church in hostility and oppression. There's nothing that stops the movement of God. You, you got to feel the earth rumbling right now. You got to feel what's going on beneath the surface. You got to go beyond your flesh and how you feel into what you sense in your spirit that God is establishing something, that He's building something. When He says, I will build my church, you got to get on board with that and you got to play your part and your role. Because when, when we look at building the church, okay, there are some things we can measure collectively. It shows up on a spreadsheet. We all did it together, right? 5,300 foster teens in the state of Ohio and our church and some churches came together and we hit every single foster teen with two gift cards, you know, across the state of Ohio and, and, and a, you know, a Merry Christmas and we, we've got your back and we're in your corner. We're praying for you. Like, amazing, right? We can measure that. We did that collectively. We threw our weight into that as a church. Um, many of you funded and built bunk beds for foster families that said, we want to bring in a foster kid. We just don't have an extra bedroom, but if we do this, this, then the county will give us a foster kid. We can bring this kid into a family. And so, I mean, we had a crew out here, man, building bunk beds. Amazing. Some of you guys paid for us. I can't be there to make them, but I'll buy them. Awesome. You know, this last year, pandemic, tons of people out of work and some people weren't at work and that or weren't out of work so they said I'm gonna help those who are and they gave money and we were able to bring in like hundred eighty thousand dollars when everything was shut down and we were paying bills hundreds of families we were helping pay bills we were helping people eat we were helping people get medicine we were doing I mean it's just beautiful we can quantify that but when you think about God building his church through you there's those things that we all do together but think about all the the igniting of a movement. Think of all the things that you've done that don't ever show up in the photo op or nobody's captioning it, right? Like think about the time you saw a need and you rallied some folks. You're like, you know, so-and-so needs this. Hey, why don't you give a little bit and I'll give a little bit and, you, and, we'll, and we'll do this and we'll meet this need. Think about the stuff you did like Jesus did where you were like, you noticed someone that nobody else noticed, right? Remember that story, Jesus in a crowd? He's like, somebody touched me. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? Somebody touched you, Jesus? Everybody's touching you. There's people everywhere. He's like, no, no, no. Somebody touched me. It was a woman with the issue of blood. She was totally, had become hopeless. She'd given all of her money to try to find a medical solution. Every doctor let her down. Every doctor overpromised, underdelivered. And yet she came in contact with Jesus and he, he, he halts the show and he stops for her and he meets a need. And, and, and you do that. You walk through the cashier and you notice the cashier and instead of just going bloop and walking out, like you, you, you recognize their name and you keep going through that same line. You go to that same supermarket and you're speaking life into that person. You see the person other people have passed over and you notice them and you show up for them. You, you send encouraging stuff to your kids' teachers because teachers are getting it from every angle. You know, we're either too hybrid or we're not hybrid enough or we're, you know, we're shut down or we're open. And you, why, why aren't you guys cure the pandemic? Come on, you got to have a silver bullet. Nobody does. And they're, they're, they're exhausted and they're frustrated. And you took time to to email them or to call them and say, you know, you're doing a great job. Thank you for helping my kid. You know, we're making progress. We're in this together. Like, you're doing things not everybody else is doing. You know, in, in the middle of, of the racial tension that happens in the, you know, things being unearthed and it's happening, you know, in videos and social media and it's all out there and, and everybody's got an opinion and everybody's got a thought. And many have open wounds that instead of you just going and opening up and saying, here's all my opinions and here's what I think, like, like, like you're being quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. You're involving yourself in someone's healing and you're willing to advocate for somebody and you're willing to be a listener and to be an encourager and to, to open up your mind and even to ask God, Lord, what do you want me to see? What, what do you want to change in me? Like an, an, an agent of progress and change and building his church. You know, not everything's grandiose. Not everything's macro and big and huge and, and makes the front page. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the little times that you say in my situation, at my workplace, in my environment, in my family, in my extended family, here I am. Lord, use me today. At the sake of being redundant, I want to take you to a verse that's just been a, a guiding light. It's been a north star for me in this past season of my life and my family and with the church. And it's Ephesians 3.20 that says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. To him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above to do immeasurably more than we might ask or think. Let me tell you about the birthday party we thought we were gonna have. This time last year, we looked at the calendar, we said, you know, 
January 21, man, it's going to be our 10th birthday. So we, we came up with a plan. This was the plan. We were going to have church at the Nationwide Arena. We called the Nationwide. We said, hey, we want to have church at the, your arena. And they were like, who are you? And we were like, one church. And they're like, who are you? And we're like, one church. And they're, and they're like, no. And so we, we like did everything we could do. And we finally got them to tap out in Jesus' name. And they're like, yep, you guys can have church here at the Nationwide Arena. And our plan was we're gonna, we are going to drop a Petra rock on the city. Man, we're going to send a shock wave through the city. The city's going to know the body of Christ has showed up. And so the plan was to raise all the money to put the event on behind the scenes with our church people and then to put 10,000 people in the nationwide arena on the 10th birthday and then to take up an offering that day from those 10,000 people and give away every dollar, to give dollars to other churches, to help nonprofits, to help anybody who is building the body of Christ in our city. It's not about us, man. It's about what God's doing through his body. And so we want to show up for you and we want to link arms, okay? This is an awesome plan. We're starting to crank on it. We're, we're going to spend the whole year finding the right partners so the money goes to the right places. That was the plan. And then the darn coronavirus showed up. <laughs> Everything shut down. You know, we were like ready to sign the nationwide. And it was like, whew, done. Maybe someday. Who knows? But here's what I do know. What God has done and what God is doing right now is exceeding abundantly, infinitely more than what I would have asked for or you would have imagined. You got to understand that. It may not feel that way. I'm telling you, there's people right now, you're listening, you're watching. God did something in your life this year. Wouldn't have happened without the stupid virus. There were some things that were stripped away from you. There were some distractions that were taken away from you. There were some relationships that went by the wayside. There was a work that happened that's exceeding and abundantly above, and it doesn't look as grand, and it doesn't look as big, and, and it is not as pretty, but I'm telling you, it's better. You gotta believe that. You gotta understand that. You gotta walk in that. It's not your job to come up with a grand plan. It's your job to bring your here I am. Will you raise your hand? Will you say, here I am, God? Here I am in my life with the broken pieces. Here I am with my broken heart. Here I am with my broken plans. And I bring myself to build your church. And I'll do it in small ways and little ways and tiny little faithfulness and, and stuff that never shows up for people to see. But God, you see it all. So I'll bring my here I am. That's all he wants from you. Don't overcomplicate it. Hey, let the pressure... Let the pressure come off of you. Because you can say, here I am. You can do that. You can't always build the thing. We, you, you, you can't do the nationwide. It's, it's God coming up with the plan. And you say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Let's pray. Today I want to give you an opportunity for those of you that are here who have been sort of running your own direction, doing your own thing to lift a hand to say, here I am to God right now. And maybe this is the first time that you've done it, that you, you've come to the, the place of wisdom and humility that you say, you know, I know the acts of my will <laughs> are pretty fickle. I know that some of my plans, you know, have blown up. And I've come to that place where I understand my humanity and I understand God's deity. And I realize that there's an intersection today. And I don't have all the answers, and I don't know what the future holds, but I know that in this moment, in my present, I need to join my here I am with him. And if that's you, wherever you're at, would you just literally raise your hand right now and say, here I am, God. Here I am. I hear you. I receive today. Amen. Wherever you might be. Maybe you're over at Northwest. Just lift your hand where you're at. Maybe you're uh, watching from home, or maybe you're listening in your car, you know. Lift a hand. Here I am. Here I am. God sees it. It's a genuine moment. It's a pure moment between you and God. Just simply joining your here I am. Doing what you can do. Here I am. 
And God, you see these hands and you see these hearts. And so today we, we lift our hands to volunteer ourselves. First, to receive you as our Savior, that God made he who had no sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So we receive your payment for the debt of our sin. And without shame, God, we receive it. And understand that it's through your blood that we've, you purchased our freedom and our forgiveness and you made us whole. And Lord, we also receive you as our Lord, our leader, guiding and leading us into our next steps. And God, in the big and the small things, we will do our best to walk in obedience to day in and day out, one season at a time, lift our hands and say, here I am. And in that beautiful way, join the six heroes of the Bible that said, here I am, and some said it multiple times. And so, Lord, you, you're our Savior, you're our Lord. We receive you today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand up on your feet as we worship God together.